Our scripture reading today comes from Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering a gift at the altar, and there, remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for the whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right eye causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for the whole body to go into hell. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning. How are we? Doing all right? Hey, anyone um, trick or treat last night? Okay, at what point do you stop trick or treating, right? Like when you're like 23 and you're too old, you're like, okay, that's just kind of creepy, right? You got to go with the six-year-old, like a friend or something like that. Hey, last, yesterday I was pulling out of my driveway, and I'm so glad that Halloween only happens once a year. Because literally there was a zombie in front of me, right? A zombie, full zombie. And it wasn't just that I was pulling out and I was like freaked out a little bit. It stared me down. I was, I was going down my driveway. They were like, I was like, is this the living dead? You know, like what's happening right now? I'm so glad that Halloween's only once a year, and it is great to be with you all. I'm glad you're here this morning as well. Um, my name is Danny, and I work in the offices of Strengths and Vocation, and it's great to be here with you this morning. And this semester, we have been in the conversation discussing the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer comes in this greater context of the Sermon on the Mount, which Jesus gives to the crowd of people. And he says, he's giving this sermon, and he, he's talking to these people, and, and the passage that we just had read is kind of an excerpt just before the Lord's Prayer. Pretty challenging, right? Uh, pretty difficult. And this, uh, we, this, this semester, we've been thinking about the Lord's Prayer, and earlier on in the semester, we talked about a personal God, a God who knows us, who loves us, who is intimate with us, and yet, he's hollowed, he's other. Dr. Brower spoke about that. And then Esteban and Lexi, they spoke about this idea of God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Powerful statements. And the first half of the Lord's Prayer is really about this otherworldliness. It's about God's kingdom coming here on earth. And last week, we heard from Dr. Mary Paul about this very practical and tangible kingdom where we begin to pray for the needs that we have. Give us today our daily bread. And I don't know how I got stuck with this part, but I got forgive us of our debts. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Can I be honest with you? I didn't really like this one. It's kind of hard for me to think about because I knew that as I had to prepare, I had to begin to do some self-reflection on my own life. Um, and so this morning, I, I, I pray that you'll enter into that conversation with me. I, I don't step on stage knowing that I've got this figured out. But I come in the space saying, hey, I'm just with you. And I want to offer a few words that might kind of help us see God's kingdom coming here on earth as it is in heaven. Anyone have a best friend growing up? Yeah? Raise your hand. Yeah, you have, you have a best friend? Is your best friend here? Maybe you're like, they're like, I thought you were my best friend. Why don't you raise your hand? Um, I had a best friend growing up. His name is Tim. Tim and I met in the fifth grade, and we were really good friends. We, uh, we were like kind of ride or die kind of friends, right? We, during recess, we would play chess together. That's how good of friends we were. Uh, we, were we were that kind of friend. And then in, in junior high and high school, we got a little cooler. 
right? We started playing basketball, uh, kind of an upgrade, right? And so we still play chess, but um, that was something that we did together. And I, I'll never forget this one time that we had together. Um, I really loved, like, when we could have, like, sleepovers. You guys know what I'm talking about? You build forts or you play video games or girls. I don't know what you did, but um, <laughs> that's what guys do, right? We eat Cheetos and play video games. And um, in my house, uh, I lived in a loft, and I had a window that goes to the outside. And there was this one particular day when it was, I think, in the junior high, my, my friend, my best friend Tim, wanted to spend the night with me. And I knew my mom wouldn't let him spend the night. You guys ever had that moment? You're like, come on, mom. Like, you know, she's like, she, she for sure would say no. And so we had this intricate plan, right, where, where, um, where, um, where he would actually leave the house and pretend like he got locked out of his house. And then my mom, of course, would let him stay at my place because she's not going to let him sleep outside. And, but the problem was she didn't know that he was at the house. We are hanging out in the loft. And all of a sudden, uh, garage door opens. You know what that means. Mom's home. He's not supposed to be there. And so we had this loft, and he couldn't go out because that was the only way that he went. If he went out, she would see him. So I was like, hey, bro, I'm going to open the window. You jump out the window. Wait 10 minutes. Ring the doorbell. I'll pretend like I never even saw you. And then for sure she'll just she'll let us sit, spend the night. So here's the funny thing. He jumps out the window. He's in all white. Right? Roofs are dirty. Right? And so he shows up 10 minutes later, rings the doorbell. And he's like all black, like all, everything, he's like got like soot on his face. And he's like, hey, so uh, I got locked out of my house. Can I spend the night? And my mom said, she totally knew what was happening. But she was like, okay, fine, you could do that. That's a good idea. We were that kind of friend, right? Like he would jump off the roof for me. That was the kind of friend what we, what he was, right? But here's the thing. Um, we actually went to college together. And I actually applied for one school, not Point Loma. Sorry. Uh, I went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And I actually went to school with him. I wanted to live with him. That's who I wanted to be with. And as the year went on, our relationship began to change. He no longer started coming to church with me. His friend group started to change. Our second year, we didn't live together. Um, and actually, to this day, we don't really, we're not in touch. He actually transferred out. And my best friend was no longer my friend. And for so many years, I had this kind of bitterness in my heart. I said, how could a friend like that reject me? And I had to dig deep inside of me thinking, how could I forgive someone like that? Now, it might not be a friend for you, but there might be someone else that's let you down. Maybe a father, a mother, maybe a friend, maybe an aunt or an uncle, maybe a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and you've been let down. You've been hurt, and that hurt resides within you. You see, the scriptures talk a little bit about this brokenness. In the Old Testament, there's this word, shalom. And this word shalom means wholeness. It's not just an avoidance of conflict, but it's about integration. It's about unity. It's about things being made right. And this word is used almost 400 times in the Old Testament. And it speaks about the unity that God has with himself. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This shalom, this peace, and this peace extends to the earth. You see, in the very beginning, Adam and Eve, they had peace with God. They were one with him. It said that they were naked and unafraid. There was a sense of vulnerability and transparency. And there was a sense of being known. You see, there was no disintegration. And this idea of shalom is, was then broken because Adam and Eve said, we want to be like God. We want to be like who you are. We want to have control of our lives. And so we're going to take it back into our hands. And God gave the law in the Old Testament and it said, this is the standard to which you are to live by, to be perfect, to be whole, to be made right. And if you don't live up to that, you can't be in shalom with me. But here's the reality. The law was never intended to make us righteous. But it was, it was given to us so that we can be desperate for a savior. That's what the law was given for. It was a standard that was so high that we would, might be able to say, I can't do it on my own. I need someone next to me. 
to help me through it. You see, this is what it says in Matthew. In that very same passage, Jesus came, came into the disciples and the crowd he was speaking to would have been very familiar with the law. And he says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Rather, I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. You see, this idea of when we pray, forgive us our debts, forgive us our sins, forgive us our transgression, assumes that we've done something wrong. Jesus doesn't say, if you've sinned, you should pray this way. He says, pray in this way. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive us of our sins. You see, growing up, I... Um, I really didn't understand this. I really didn't understand this. This is me. I still have really bad eyes. I just wear contacts now. Legally blind. Um, anyone familiar with this, uh, this uniform? Awana. Awana, yeah, okay. We got some Awana people here. There's like two. Um, and it's okay if you don't know it. Um, but what, what Awana is, is basically you grow up and, and at once a week you memorize these verses and you get points for it. And as you can tell um, on my left badge, I've got some awards, right? So I was awarded for how many verses I could memorize. You see, my spirituality was built upon my works. My spirituality was built upon how good I was. And you see, if this was my life, if this was my life, this pot, I thought, you know what? I'm pretty good. There's a couple cracks here and there. But you know what? If I, if I get this dirty, guess what I do? Just memorize a couple more verses. If I got things, if it, if it didn't look the way I wanted it, guess what I did? Just go to church a little bit more. And I just rubbed it around, you know, and I, I just thought, I'm not that bad. You know why? Because I'm not like those people. You feel me? Anyone else think that way? At least I didn't do that. Did you hear what they did? I didn't do that. I'm all right. I'm all right. You see, my spiritualities was based upon my good works, and I would look it up, lift it up and say, God, look it, I'm good, aren't I? I'm good, aren't I? And Jesus has been working on my heart in the last several years, and he's been saying, Danny, you're not so good. You know, I told you, it says in the Old Testament, don't murder anyone. But if you hate your brother or sister, you've already committed murder in your heart. The last several weeks in the news, I mean years, right? But it just specifically in the last couple weeks, it's been incredibly hard, hasn't it? If you're not paying attention to the news, I would encourage you to. My th uh, seminary professor, he always reminded me, said, a good Christian holds their Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. How do we engage our world with what the scriptures might say to us and to these current times? And the last few weeks, I've been reflecting on just the mass shootings. I know some of you have been hurt by that. Even last night, there was an act of terror in New York where a guy ran, drove down um, a sidewalk with bikes. I texted my buddy that this morning who lives there. He's okay. But he says, we frequent that area. That could have been him. He was a guy I went to college with. But more recently, one of the things that really struck a chord and, and um, struck home with me, I'll take that picture off of me, uh, <laughs> uh, that struck a chord for me was this, Harvey Weinstein. This movie mogul who literally, I'm sure all of us have seen one of his movies, was just penalized, right? It has had, has had all dozens of women, I think up to 58 women come out and say, I've been sexually abused by him. And I've been reading these news, and these things were distant for me, and there was like, ah, oh, that's, that's not a big deal. And then I began to see on my social media feed something else. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Hashtag me too. And it's these courageous women who are saying, this is the way I've been hurt before. And it's actually not women only. It's men as well. And this idea of me too says, let me share my story. Let me show the world of the ways in which I've been hurt. And it really began to struck a chord in me when I saw my friends that I know, that I live and play with, saying the exact same things on this feed. 
And I was like, I thought that was for Hollywood. But this is happening here, right here, right now. And then I started getting really upset, right? You know that feeling that you get? You're just, you have this righteous anger and you're like, this can't be. This can't be. How could this happen to people? How could this happen to my friends? And then I began to reflect on myself. You see, I'm not so perfect, am I? I'm broken. I too. It was me too. I wasn't the victim. I'm the perpetrator. When I look lustfully at a woman, I've committed adultery in my heart. When I have pride over my brother or sister, and I think they need to lose in order for me to win, I've lost. And my wholeness that I thought was once there has been shattered. God, would you forgive me? Would you forgive me of the ways that I have the propensity to be like Harvey Weinstein? Would you forgive me of the ways in which I hate people that don't look like me or talk like me or are not in the same socioeconomic status as me? Would, I, would you forgive me of the ways I cast judgment on my brothers and sisters right here in this room? Would you forgive me of the ways in which I envy them and I wish they didn't have that because I want it? Would you forgive me of the ways in which I don't tell the truth in my classes so that I can get a better grade to be elevated? You guys know what I'm talking about? And as soon as we start pointing the figure out there, we have to realize that there's a finger pointing right here. But here's the thing. God doesn't leave us there, does he? God doesn't leave us there. He doesn't leave me and you in the depths of our sin. You know what he does? He reaches down and he says, let me put you back together. In the 15th century, there was this Japanese shogun. And he had his favorite pottery. And the favorite pottery that he had, it broke. And this is what he began to do. Now I don't know the pieces all together, right? The shogun said, I want to put this piece back together, and I'm going to fill it with gold. And what this gold is going to represent is the broken pieces in our lives. And he didn't say this, but this is the analogy that I'm using today, is what are the broken pieces in your life that God has to mend back together? You see, in this art form, it talks about this way that the pottery actually looks better when it's broken and when it's pieced back together. This pottery gets put back together one bit at a time. And this ancient art form is called kintsuki, and it literally means golden joinery. And when you and I begin to have this posture of confession, when we begin to have a posture of of asking for forgiveness, you know what happens? God begins to mend us back together. And out of our brokenness, we're made more beautiful. Listen to what this pastor has to say, Pastor Tulian. He says this, God's capacity to forgive us is greater than our capacity to forgive. Do you guys believe that this morning? While our sin reaches far, God's grace reaches farther. And in the pieces of our lives that we think that can never be put back together, he says, I know that I can put you back together. That in this posture of forgiveness and of confession, he says, let me make you whole once again. 
But you see, this is the reality. The gospel is not for the saints. It's for the sinners, amen? It's not for the perfect, but it's for the prostitute. It's not for the well-off, but it's for the worn out. It's not for the beautiful and those that have it all fit together. It's for the broken and the weary. It's not for the courageous, but it's for the cowardly. This is the gospel of Christ, that in our confession of sin, Christ comes to make us whole again. You see, we have this posture of forgiveness, but it doesn't just stay there, right? It's not just about my forgiveness, because when we receive the forgiveness of Christ, we begin to say, forgive those who sin against me. In C.S. Lewis's Letters to Malcolm, he actually speaks about this. C.S. Lewis, it's a, it's, a, it's a book about these prayers and how men, men and women can connect with God. And Lewis speaks with this European minister who had seen Hitler in Europe. He had seen Hitler. And Lewis asked him, what did Hitler look like? And you know what the minister said? Like Christ, of course. I don't know if I could have said that. But this is a guy who has experienced the incredible power of the forgiveness of Christ in his life. And he begins to look at other people with empathy and compassion. And he begins to see them as Christ does. And he says, I know that's not what is right, but I need to begin to reorient the way I see my brothers and sisters to love my enemy and to pray for those who persecute me. When we talk about forgiveness, I want to keep in mind that there's many of you in this space that have lots of things in your heart that maybe you're thinking, Danny, there's no, you don't know my story. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know the pain that's been caused in my life. And I don't. I don't. But you know what I know? There's a God who knows that story. And he's coming back. He's coming back to mend those broken pieces if you would allow him to do so. Point Lama, what would our community look like if you and I began to look at each other the way Christ does? What it, would it look like if we began to say, I don't need to show up with everything fit, put together, that I actually believe in a God who sees my brokenness and meets me exactly where I am? What would it look like? What would this community look like? What would San Diego look like? If we begin to say, I see your brokenness, and we're going to be there. We're going to cry with those who are crying. We're going to mourn with those who mourn. What would our world look like if Christians, brothers and sisters in this place, began to say, me too. This is the way I failed. But you know what? I know a God who's further and greater still. As Brian comes up, and we're going to lead out with one more song. We've got a few minutes. Here's a couple things. I'm going to read a lyric for you, which I think encapsulates this idea. And on Wednesday, as we usually do, we give space for people to linger and to pray and to worship. Today, would you do me a favor? If you have somewhere to go, would you just exit in silence, please? There's some people that need to do some work here with God. And there's some people who need their broken lives put back together through confession and prayer. So let me read this lyric. You can close your eyes. You can sit quietly. But let me read this lyric for you. Forgiveness is the garment of our courage. The power to make the peace we long to know. 
Open our eyes to see the wounds that bind all of humankind. May our shutter hearts greet the dawn of life with charity and love. When I look into the face of my enemy, I see my brother, I see my sister, I see my mother, I see my father. When I look into the face of my enemies, I see my brother, I see my sister. God, we, we are thankful that you are a God that reaches into the brokenness of our lives and makes us whole again. You see the ways in which we're fractured and we're broken and we're in desperate need of a savior. So would you open our eyes to see our need for you this morning, this week, this year? And would we have a posture that extends that forgiveness to one another?